Hi. So, have you ever become really good at something because you were forced to? So, as an Asian kid growing up in Hong Kong, it was inevitable that I was sent to do this thing called Kumon. It's a Japanese-based tutoring method that forces kids to do a booklet or two every day of these mixed math exercises. And if you didn't do your booklets, you couldn't go outside to play. This is a photo of me doing Kumon. <laughs> so naturally, the skill I honed and became really good at was hiding these exercises around the house. <laughs> and I believe the same thing happened to us during the pandemic. Because whether or not we realize it, we've all become really good at self-testing. By the end of 2022, the U.S. had performed more than one billion COVID tests, and the U.K. half a billion. Practice makes perfect, am I right? And to those of you who didn't like the self-testing, I'm very sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but self-test kits in general are here to stay. What started off mainly as pregnancy testing and glucose monitoring at home has exploded into a growing market of self-test kits for looking at everything from your genetics, ancestry, cholesterol levels, disease detection, sensitivities to different foods, fertility, and even to the different types of bacteria that are in your gut. You name it. For most of these test kits, you can order and do them from the comfort of your own home without moving an inch on your couch. And have pages of results sent back to your companion smartphone app for you to explore, powered by recent advancements in big data analytics, and by the fact that it is now dirt cheap to sequence your DNA for around 70 quid compared to what it was 20 years ago, which would have been around a thousand. And all this is part of a bigger movement that people called healthcare 4.0. My 19-year-old brother says I sound like a boomer when I say this word. But trust me, it's a real term, and it's a fancy umbrella term to describe the paradigm shift in healthcare that's coming about as a result from advancements in biology synergizing with industry 4.0 developments. Things like you've heard today, like ML, uh, AI, and uh, big data. And what this looks like is telemedicine, wearables, big data health analytics, and new electronic health systems. Which all feel the shift from sick care into healthcare. What used to be a reactive system where we treated symptoms and problems as they came up has shifted into trying to prevent the onset of serious diseases where we can, and now to monitoring our bodies for predictive and personalized health. And what I find the most interesting about this predictive and personalized nature of healthcare 4.0 is that. A lot of it actually boils down to what we do as everyday individuals, and not just what healthcare providers, your doctors, and clinicians do. And this is because of all these new direct-to-consumer healthcare products that have become available to us, and they present us with an opportunity to learn more about our bodies without needing to be sick in the first place. And by being more informed, you can now take charge of your health in unprecedented ways. But just as New tools birth new worlds, like when smartphones took over by storm. Different people react to shiny new products differently, and whether or not these new health tech products can actually benefit or possibly even harm you depends on the type of person you are. This is a technology adoption curve, which you might have seen before. With new technologies, there are always the fanatics, the early adopters who want to be the first ones to try the new tech on market. Then there's the majority adopters who are the masses,、uh, who might have FOMO and want to jump onto the latest bandwagon. And finally, there are the skeptical laggards who might not use products until they've already been incorporated into the system. And today, I want to tell you stories of three people I've met along this technology adoption curve、uh, in my life, and I want to push you to ask yourself: Can you relate to any of them? First off, are you an Alex? So, for my undergrad and master's years, I spent them in、uh, sunny Berkeley in California, which is pretty much the most progressive, hipster,、uh, and liberal school you'll ever find in the states. It was so progressive that Trump decided、uh, or threatened to cut federal funding to our school after we protested against some hate speech in 2017. But 
Anyways, it's also next door to Silicon Valley, so you can imagine how every other person you bump into on campus is probably telling you about their new startup or uh, telling you about a new technology that they're really excited about. That happened to be my freshman year doormate, Alex, and we quickly became best friends because we both majored in molecular cell biology together. And Alex would strut into his lecture with uh, Fitbit on and raving about Google's new smart contact lenses. So it wasn't long before he convinced me to do this relatively new genetic self-test kit. So we ordered the self-test kit, we spat into a tube, mailed it off, and waited a few weeks. Results came back. It was cool. Um, surprise, surprise, I'm 99% Chinese. That's what I learned. <laughs> And Alex learned that he sneezes when the sunlight shines into his eyes, which is apparently called the photic sneeze reflex. But because we were biology nerds, we went one step further. We actually downloaded the raw DNA sequences um, from our data files, which is a feature they took off now. Um, and Alex wanted to run the data using his own computer scripts, trying to see if he can find additional facts about himself that the genetic testing company couldn't. And surprisingly, he found out that he had the DNA mutation that is very strongly associated with serious fatty liver disease. Another thing about Alex that I didn't tell you about is he's a slightly neurotic person. So with this newfound anxiety, he actually went into the clinic to do a blood test for his liver health. Uh, obviously, normal results came back, but he told me, Tiffany, ignorance is bliss because now I'm extra paranoid about uh, liver disease or possibly even liver cancer, even though we were at the ripe age of 21 years old. What we can learn from Alex is that even though as an early adopter in the market, you can flex being uh, the first one to try these new cool products, uh, you might not know what to do with new pieces of information that may act more as noise than signal, um, especially when it can cause unwanted anxiety. So after Berkeley, I came over to the UK to do my PhD. Um, and when I, I'd like to ask you if you are a Charlotte. Charlotte was my British lawyer friend, and um, it was during COVID days with limited access to clinic and hospitals when she thought it was the best time to start dating. So Charlotte started dating this new guy, and she told me that she had ordered these at-home STI self-test kits through the NHS. I was quite surprised because I didn't know you could do that from home. Anyways, uh, so I asked Charlotte, which STIs are going to test for? There are quite a lot of them out there. And she said, Tiffany, the Pareto principle. And I said, the Pareto what? And she said, the Pareto principle. It's also called the 80-20 rule, where 20% of the causes or input usually leads to 80% of the outcomes. It's just like how 80% uh, of the profits in a company usually comes from 20% of the customers or how 20% of your wardrobe is worn 80% of the time. <laughs> and she said, actually, most of the STIs that are contracted by people only come from 20% of all of the known pathogens uh, that cause STIs out there. Uh, so naturally, she was going to be a smart cookie and just test for the 20%. Charlotte is someone I would identify as a majority adopter in the market, because she's using these STI self-test kits um, which, with concentrated effort, have made it in a into a credible system like the NHS uh, as one of its beachhead customers. And Charlotte has taught us that majority adopters are pragmatic more than anything else. As a cancer biologist, uh, when Charlotte talked about the Pareto Principle, it reminded me of a similar pattern in oncology, where a critical few actions can really move the needle. And that is the fact that one-third of cancers that currently cause deaths can actually be cured simply by detecting them earlier and treating them with existing drugs and therapies. And this is very evident in the stats. Here's a graph from the CRUK website for lung cancer, and if you look at the purple-pinkish dots, you see that the later the stage at which you diagnose the cancer, the lower the chance of survival for the patient. And you see in the blue bars that, unfortunately, most cases aren't diagnosed till the later stages when the disease has already spread and become malignant. 
On a more cheerful note, the NHS has been inspired by our self-testing prowess and has rolled out these home self-test kits for looking at uh, bowel, bowel cancer and HPV-driven cancers, which have already led to reports of lives being saved. Finally, are you like my grandpa? <laughs> my grandpa is your stereotypical technophobe, uh, he doesn't understand why smartphones have to be so complicated, and he would much rather use your Nokia break phone. Anyways, every morning before his cup of joe, my grandpa would prick his finger with an ouch and use the blood on this glucose monitoring device because he's a diabetic and he needs to keep an eye on his sugar levels. My grandpa is the prime example of a laggard on the technology adoption curve because uh, he's only using this glucose monitoring device because all his peers are, and namely because his doctor told him to. And sadly, he rejects all my suggestions when I tell him to try out uh, more non-invasive glucose monitoring devices I've rolled out in market, simply because he's not bothered and he doesn't think about it. A good thing my grandpa does without thinking about too much is that he actually attends all his body checkups, healthcare appointments on time, and he's quit smoking 20-something odd years ago. He's lived in Hong Kong, which boasts the highest life expectancy in the world, beating Japan. And many studies and experts argue that it's because of the tough government action on smoking, as well as easy access to good health care, which encourage people to be on top of their health. I know what you're thinking. Tiffany, I'm not going to move to Hong Kong just for the slightly higher life expectancy. Don't worry, I'm not telling you to, but it is worth considering how Hong Kong pushes for a culture of being conscientious about your health, where conscientiousness is usually just defined as doing the right thing. And it's one of the big five ocean personality traits that psychologists and psychiatrists love talking about. And I looked into this, and interestingly, I found that multiple studies uh, and reports have shown that conscientiousness is the strongest personality pre predictor of longevity, further than any other personality traits. Going back to the last three people I talked about, even though Alex, Charlotte, and gran my grandpa are on different parts of the technology adoption curve, what they share in common is that they all, to some de degree, are conscientious about their health which is the most important thing. So now that you know about the pros and cons of being on different parts of the technology adoption curve, uh, the most important thing to remember is that it is easier than ever before to be conscientious about our health. And as these new healthcare 4.0 tools and more home self-test kits uh, roll out, it is really important for us to pick products that are good for our bodies our lifestyles, and our personality types. So my last question for you today is, who will you be in Healthcare 4.0? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>